Alex Paulson, who is actually in Paris, and he is the founder of the Institute for Collective Intelligence, and he will give us a very nice lecture, a short one about democracy. Lex, can you hear me? And thank you for this, um, this invitation. It's a real pleasure to uh, rejoin the World Human Forum after uh, a wonderful visit to Delphi. Um, and uh, I uh, am really pleased also to be sharing this session with um, one of my great friends and mentors, Paul Cartledge, who will uh, uh, give a uh, greater insight than I'm capable of into democracy and its roots. But I want to share a couple of thoughts about uh, this new science, this new field um, that's emerging um, uh, called collective intelligence and tell you a little bit about it and where it comes from and hopefully what we hope to do to uh, make the world uh, a better and more humane place. So I'm going to um, share uh, my screen host disabled attendee screen sharing. So if a host could please give me the rights to share my screen, that would be fantastic. Yes, you got it now. Here we go, perfect. Okay. Um, you see my screen okay? okay. That's perfect, yeah. Perfect. perfect, thank you. So, um, as Alexandra said, uh, if we're thinking about the deep history of democracy, we have to, um, put ourselves back in the natural world, uh, the world that uh, pre-existed us and that contains so much um, uh, experience and wisdom that I think can inspire us today. Um, intelligence, uh, the word uh, at its root in English comes from Latin uh, intelligere, which means to, to combine things, to bring things together, specifically uh, uh, ideas, notions, uh, talents that allow um, uh, allow complex uh, uh, problems to be to be solved. Um, and where I want to begin is the idea that uh, this kind of collaboration, this kind of complex collaboration, is not only a human creation, um, but rather something that is common all throughout the natural world. Um, what, but there is something that makes us a little bit different. Now, many of you have seen um, ants or bees uh, uh, do very complex things collectively. Uh, know that um, what, we're, what we're witnessing, what an ant colony can do, uh, involves a very large scale of individuals, um, but rather limited flexibility, meaning that uh, an ant colony learns at the scale of generations, it takes uh, a lot of trial and error and adaptation to, uh, to create this kind of uh, intelligence at its uh, a collective level. Closer in evolution to us, of course, we have uh, primates uh, and mammals and, and, and specifically primates like chimpanzees who are also capable as groups of uh, complex activities, uh, foraging, building, making tools. Um, but the difference uh, between uh, chimpanzees and ants is that uh, they can do much more flexible, sophisticated actions as a group, but only with others that they have a, a direct one-to-one -one relationship with. Um, so the scale is very limited, but the flexibility is, is much greater. What makes human beings really unique is our ability to collaborate both very flexibly and at very large scale. This is something that makes us different than other species in the natural world. This is one of, uh, one of my favorite Christmas markets. My, uh, one of my ex uh, favorite examples of, of uh, human collaboration um, at large scale that involves lots of different actors, uh, meeting, buying, selling, uh, sharing, singing, uh, that is done in a highly organized and sophisticated way, but that can be very different um, from one day to the next. Um, so what I want to say first is collective intelligence is a phenomenon that is all around us, uh, but unfortunately in the year 2020, um, collective stupidity is as well. Uh, mobs form, markets fail, elections uh, are derailed, and so collective stupidity is as much a part of our world as collective intelligence. Well, what makes the difference? This is what the science of collective intelligence uh, seeks to study. Uh, and so uh, at its core, our definition has two parts. What is collective intelligence? Well, first, it's a natural phenomenon, an ability to solve complex problems as a group, the ability to do things at the collective level that any individual, even the smartest, most brilliant, capable individual could not do alone. So that's something that happens in nature and something that humans do uh, 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 uniquely. 
but also it's a, it's a field, a field of study in itself that allows us to look at the conditions of this kind of intelligence within teams, within societies, within companies, uh, and within institutions. Um, democracy was one of uh, the first and most, uh, and most uh, interesting examples of collective intelligence in, uh, in the uh, political uh, world. We uh, had egalitarian models of, of, of making decisions uh, at a much smaller scale. If you go to a village today in, in rural Greece, um, there are, you might see very similar practices to, uh, to 10,000 years ago of how people know each other and make decisions, but it's based on face-to-face -face relationships. Well, in the first democracy on the Pnyx uh, in the fifth century uh, BCE, um, you had thousands of people coming together who might not know each other's names, but who were capable of de collectively declaring war, creating a nation, uh, creating changes to currency, um, as juries deciding uh, on, on complex uh, disputes. Uh, and this was something that was, uh, was, was new uh, and unique and something that we still have not realized uh, uh, its potential. Um, one of the godfathers of our field is Aristotle, who was, as Paul will point out, is, is, was not a Democrat, but someone who understood this unique quality of large groups. He talks about uh, what it's like to throw a, a big dinner party, for example. And he says that the many who are not as individuals excellent, nevertheless can, when they have come together, be better collectively than the few best people, just as feasts to which many contribute are better than feasts provided at one person's expense. Now, why is that? Because you have many different tastes, many different talents, maybe someone who loves making flour or uh, ornaments, others who are great cooks for meat, others who prepare great salads. And so we see in this diversity of talents, this diver what we call cognitive diversity, how we look at problems, how we think through solutions, that bringing together different types of mentality, different types of people can have this collective impact that's much greater than any individual alone. Well, why would you want to include, therefore, the masses, the demos uh, in political power. Paul is, is careful to point out that uh, democracy was not just the rule of the many, but in fact, the rule of the poor, the majority poor over the, over the, uh, uh, the few, the elite uh, wealthy. Well, what, why would ever a city accept to do this? The cynical argument is, well, you give power to people because it keeps them under control, keeps them quiet, keeps them not complaining. But his stronger argument using this analogy of the feast is, that including this larger circle in, in political decisions, in, in deliberation, uh, uh, can enhance the quality of those decisions by, by bringing all of these different kinds of expertise together. So thinking today, we talk about two dimensions of collective intelligence. One is this technical dimension that together as a large society, we can find better solutions. So think about the COVID crisis, the number of different laboratories that were sharing parts of the, the genetic code of, of the virus uh, or sharing different uh, experimental findings on potential vaccines. This is collective intelligence to find solutions. But collective intelligence is also uh, important for our sense of belonging and our sense of purpose. And this is what we call the ethical dimension of collective intelligence, that societies that exclude, societies that, uh, that suppress people's rights to say what they think and participate uh, are less stable and, and less, uh, and less uh, functional. And so uh, we think both about collective intelligence as a tool to make better decisions, this technical dimension, and a tool to make society more coherent, more inclusive, uh, and, and, more, and more just. Why is this so important right now? Because our political institutions, for the most part, um, are 100, 200, even 300 years old. We're in a digital age, and we're working within political institutions that were created with parchment and, and quill. Uh, and uh, these were institutions that were not created to maximize participation and inclusion, but to create this balance between elite rights and some kind of popular participation, normally through elections. And those of us who talk about democracy today, because we were raised in the late 20th century, we think that democracy is voting. Whereas, as Paul will point out, democracy uh, is much, much more uh, than simply casting a ballot once every four years for a, a political party. And this is what we need to be rethinking now, how to go beyond this 18th century uh, vision of uh, of democracy as voting 
once a year uh, to something more expansive, something more uh, inclusive. This is equally true in the private sector where companies that were built on 100 year old models uh, are now finding their employees that are asking for greater participation, for greater belonging, for greater sense of responsibility and autonomy. And yet our institutions are still so backward looking and so conservative. And so this is what calls on us now to help reinvent and transform these institutions because our problems are more complex than the design of these institutions that we have inherited. To do this, we have to understand ourselves. As, as the Oracle has said at Delphi, uh, understand yourself, know yourself. And uh, in the last 30 years, this incredible revolution in cognitive science, behavioral economics uh, has shown us uh, to what degree uh, our brains uh, have, have shortcuts, have weaknesses, have blind spots. Um, this is just a, a small map, a section of a map called the Cognitive Bias Codex. All the different ways in which our brains uh, sometimes fail to produce rational outcomes, to save energy, uh, to uh, uh, save our, uh, our, our functioning in society. We, we make decisions or we follow arguments, whether it's on Facebook and Twitter, or even in our own families that, that don't always make sense. Um, so we at the School of Collective Intelligence, we have uh, three core subjects that we treat. Um, cognition, so thinking about the, the mind and how intelligence works. Systems, how to design more intelligent systems as Cleisthenes did uh, in, uh, in the late 6th century Athens. And uh, facilitation, how do you bring through nonviolent communication, emotional intelligence, uh, uh, entrepreneurship skills, storytelling and narrative, how do you bring this kind of uh, intelligent system to life and make it work? And finally, there's so many wonderful examples of societies, cities, especially cities, uh, using civic technology, but also face-to-face -face deliberation to bring citizens, uh, whether it's Ireland or Iceland or Senegal, uh, uh, Lebanon, places all over the world are starting to rediscover uh, the, the, that bringing people in to, uh, to uh, an active conversation, not just voting, but really sharing ideas, sharing observations, uh, and, and making collective decisions uh, can produce better quality decisions overall. And so this is really the power of collective intelligence. This field is growing. We are partnered with MIT, uh, NYU Gov, uh, GovLab, uh, Yale, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and it brings in many uh, different domains from computer science uh, and mathematics to social sciences, medicine, even uh, arts, uh, neuroscience. And uh, our hope is at our school in, uh, based in Ben Gurion, Morocco, to produce new knowledge for a more sustainable society, to break down barriers between countries, between also intellectual disciplines, uh, and between uh, theory and practice to create this kind of urgent dialogue that the world needs now. Uh, we have just this week finished accrediting our, uh, the world's first master's program, two-year master's program in collective intelligence that will launch this fall. Uh, we're starting exciting research on cross-cultural dialogue and cognitive development, and we're uh, doing so in a way that breaks down silos to allow a more rapid transfer of knowledge to the real world and a global bridge between uh, cultures, continents, uh, and societies. So I welcome you to join uh, join the conversation. You can visit our website at sci.um6p.ma or send me an email. Uh, and with that, I am very happy to, uh, to share the stage and, uh, and continue the conversation. And thank you for your attention. Thank you later, also with questions from the auditorium. Uh, thank you, Lex. That was very good and great to get that insight, also in connection with collective intelligence. Uh, I like the term of CI because uh, we all know AI, but CI is really a term, I think, that we have to use and to practice. So I'm now interested to find out if Paul Cartledge is with us. Scott, can you um, connect us with Paul? Can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. Here you are. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Paul, welcome. Welcome. Where are you exactly right now? I am in Cambridge, England, and I can hear the Delphic echo very loud and clear all the way from Delphi to Cambridge. 
Can you hear me now? Y yes, we can hear you well, Paul. Shall I Great. Welcome. Now? Okay. Well, it's... So, we are ready for your speech. Thank you very much indeed to Jochen and thank you to, especially to Alexandra. It was a great privilege and pleasure to meet you in Athens not so long ago when you told me all about this wonderful organization. So I'm very honored to take part, but I gather I have not too many minutes. And so as I am an honorary citizen of Sparta, not of Athens, I shall be laconic. And uh, I'm going to try to do in the next five to 10 minutes, uh, a couple of things. One, to pick up from where Lex so brilliantly introduced Aristotle. And secondly, say just a little bit about digital democracy, ancient and modern, or rather ancient as contrasted with and differentiated from modern. So Aristotle, as Karl Marx called him, was a giant thinker. He was a political theorist and analyst, but also a sociologist of the ancient Greek polis. And it's very important to remember the work that is attributed to him under the title politics, politica, does not mean what we understand by politics. It means much more narrowly things to do with the polis, which is a particular form of political institution. We translate it citizen state, sometimes city state. But the key thing, and this is actually why it's so relevant to our session today, which is all about connection, the polis, of which there were many hundreds in ancient Greece, hundreds and hundreds, getting on for a thousand in Aristotle's day in the later fourth century BCE, the polis was a strong community, a koinonia, a community of citizens, a collectivity. So connection, connectivity must be the keynote if we're looking at Aristotle. However, as Lex has already said, Aristotle was not <clears throat> in the way in which the ancient Greeks did and understood politics. Aristotle was not a democrat. And that was really because the ancients did their politics and so democracy directly, which meant that ordinary people, the masses, the poor, might preponderate over their weight of numbers, might overcome what he would have considered to be wise, rational counsel, as put forward by the relatively more intelligent, more educated few. However, unlike some of his um, near contemporaries, for example, Plato, Aristotle was not a raving anti-democrat. And as Lex in that lovely slide pointed out, Aristotle was able to see the merits of democracy insofar as it allowed, and the other images he uses of different opinions. So in other words, one opinion may not be better than a multiplicity of opinions put together, as it were, shaken up and let's see what comes out at the end. So that consensus can be uh, evolved from a multiplicity of equal contributions of opinions, which is one of the fundamentals of democracy, ancient as well as modern, namely equality. The other one is, of course, freedom. Aristotle, therefore, was able to see that democracy, ancient Greek style, and there were several varieties, he analyzed four, had its merits, but still he, being an intellectual, I think that's the real problem or the real reason why he wasn't a democrat in an ancient Greek sense, though some intellectuals were, Pericles being perhaps the most famous, he saw that um, there was a sense in which it was probably better to moderate extreme. So rather than extreme mass rule or mob rule, he wanted that to be tempered by some sort of input from a few, and even he was prepared to see some elements of monarchical government as having a value. So he wanted a mix. It's actually rather a complicated notion, but he's one of the earliest theorists of the mixed constitution, as opposed to any simple, direct, uniform type of constitution. 
So that's the first point to make. You and I might think, well, ancient Greeks, presumably they were all Democrats. Well, no, they weren't. Uh, Aristotle, he was one of the smartest of the ancient Greeks. The Greeks invented democracy. Uh, Aristotle lived much of his adult life in Athens. He must have been a Democrat. He wasn't. So these are just some things to bear in mind. Then the other thing I want to say, and this is uh, the other half of uh, my contribution, is about digital democracy. My most recent publication is in fact about digital democracy, ancient as opposed to modern. I took part in a conference at the Swiss Institute in Rome, and it was all about direct democracy, and therefore the way in which that's done today, mostly direct democracy, is via the referendum. And the Swiss have been doing them for a long time, and they're actually quite sophisticated at doing them, whereas a certain other country that I could mention, which doesn't do them very often, doesn't do them very well. So referendum is, of course, uh, in origin a Latin word, and so too is digital. The Greeks did digital democracy in the sense that, you remember one of Lex's slides, uh, sorry to see no social distancing by, there, by the way. At any rate, they used to raise their right hand. That was the way in which you vote in a public assembly, for example, on the Pnyx Hill underneath the Acropolis in Athens. And then since there might be as many as 6,000 people in one of those meetings, it would have taken too long actually individually to ballot. And so the vote was normally told, it was guesstimated, unless it was terribly close or seemingly so, in which case then you would cast a pebble, a psyphos, and that's where our word psyphology comes from. A psyphos is a ballot, a, pe a pebble, literally a stone, a rock. The other way in which ancient Athenian Democrats used their fingers, their digits, to do democracy was when they were jurors. Now, we think that there should be some sort of separation in modern constitutional government between the various um, powers of government, the executive, the legislature, the judicature. The ancients didn't think that. If you rule in the assembly, you pass a, a law, for example, then you rule also in the law courts where that law might be tested. So jury service was a principal way in which an ordinary Athenian on an annual daily basis might be doing democracy. And Lex quite rightly said that for ancient Greeks, democracy wasn't something that happened only every so often. It was a, a daily uh, occurrence for them. And so when the time came to decide what penalty a defendant, if found guilty, should suffer, each juryman had a tablet with wax, beeswax, the long line, you run your nail through the wax across the uh, tablet, the longer line meant guilty or a heavier punishment, the shorter one not guilty or a lighter sentence. So. That's ancient digital democracy, direct, very simple, if you like, by our standards, simplistic. Modern technology is something the ancient Greeks couldn't possibly have dreamed of. And when it was first invented, first the internet, then the World Wide Web, e-democracy, e in a different sense from eco in Delphi, people, I think, were over-optimistic. They were naively optimistic that this would be the way to empower ordinary persons on an equal basis wherever they might be in the world, as we today are participating in this extraordinary seminar, wherever we are in the world. This might be the way to do democracy in the future. Of course, a lot was left out of that uh, equation. And I think perhaps the most sinister, this is me speaking here, it's a very personal view, but the most sinister two words almost in the political lexicon now for me are Cambridge Analytica. Not Cambridge on its own, but Cambridge allied with Analytica. In other words, the possibility of fixing, of intervening in a negative, even illegal way, into the political process via online messaging, emailing and other ways involving crookedness, telling lies that are very persuasive. In other words, using the techniques of advertising, which we're now well familiar with, but in a new way, 
And in my own country, there have been some wonderful reflections upon this, uh, actually in the theater, as well as in a whole torrent of um, political analytical uh, literature. But I just would leave you with that thought, that what was thought to be a terrifically positive advance by way of e-technology might actually also be one of its, um, well, dare I say it, Achilles heels. So if you have been listening to me, thank you so much. It's been a real privilege to be part of this uh, wonderful experience. Thank you very much. I'm coming in a little bit late. We had a technical problem earlier on, uh, but here I am now. I want to welcome you both, Lex and you. It is true that when I heard uh, Lex uh, uh, two years ago when we first met, speaking about collective intelligence uh, and uh, the connection to democracy, it was like a real revelation to me. And uh, since then we've been working together. And uh, of course, uh, I think we are right now uh, experiencing and experimenting with many ways how to, to rethink and to reinvent our democracies. And uh, there are other ways of doing it than what you just mentioned, which are all those citizen conventions at local levels, at national levels. I was thinking of what's happening in France with the um, citizen climate convention, 150 citizens coming together, working for six months on French climate policy and coming out with recommendations that go much further than the French government was expecting them to be. So there is a lot going on and I think we should uh, continue working on this field. So uh, we possibly both you and Lex can come back to this and comment on what I just said, but we also have a third guest with us who is in the US. This is Gina Belafonte. And this brings in another element of democracy, which is activism. And I want us to remember that when we say that uh, uh, ecological uh, civilization, as we heard about this morning, uh, if it exists, it has to go with democracy. Because unless citizens not only participate and invent solutions, but also have the freedom to express themselves, they can't be this change we are aspiring for. So these things are really connected, those notions, uh, sustainability, ecological civilization, democracy is inherent part of it. And of course, also because of freedom, because let's think about the young Greta Thunberg in Sweden, if she weren't living in a democracy, she wouldn't be able to mobilize us all. So I think Jochen and I want to welcome now Gina. Have we Gina with us, Gina Belafonte? Great. Hi, Hello. Gina. Good morning to California. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm feeling very privileged and blessed to be able to gather with everyone here in community. So thank you for inviting me. And this is my fourth, I think, or third um, World Human Forum. I'm wearing my, uh, my symbol here. And I'm just happy to be an ongoing partner with this incredible group of folks. Thank you, Tina. Tina, um, we prepared the session a little bit. For, for us, it's very important um, to hear from you um, really about the activism. You, you are talking about your father stands for a legacy of artists who took position, who became really a poli political activist, an artivist, as you call those people. Yes. Um, what is so necessary now in the world, and look at our cube. I want to show you how the cube looks like now. Maybe the cube is, has multi colors now because the different sides of the cube have emerged during the, the sessions that we had so far. So how important is for you diversity in context, especially in your country, in the United States? What is your experience with the actual, with the Sankofa Foundation that you started? and all the movement, the social movement. Can you share a little bit of your experience, please, Gina? Sure, sure. Again, thanks so much for, for having me here. Um, well, you know, the United States is such a very interesting experiment. Um, there's so many uh, things about our democracy, I think that are very well intended, but through generations, I think have been extremely misguided for sure. 
Um, and I guess that is part of the um, evolution of democracy in some ways. Um, you know, uh, we know the history, I think, uh, of, of America. And so we know how important it was for black and brown people to get the opportunity to finally vote, to really participate fully uh, in that way in our democracy here in America. And that um, is the biggest threat still to people of color here in, in the United States is um, the threat of losing their capacity to vote. Um, you know, activism here takes very many forms. Um, and I think that um, it is not always the will of the people that speaks um, to what our government represents. Um, but for me, I grew up in a family of activists. Both my parents um, were deeply embedded in the civil rights movement, in the Native American movement with AIM, with also uh, before or parallel to the civil rights movement, the liberation of many African countries as well. And um, I think it is their ongoing quest that we just have all people have equity. It's very difficult to find equity, true equity in capitalism. Um, but given the fact that this is the way in which this country was founded and is choosing to continue to move forward, we're finding more and more that the people are looking for an evolution more than a revolution. Um, and I think that it's important for us to understand that even in looking at our constitution or looking at the way in which our democracy functions, activism plays a huge, huge role in the people's voice and getting the word out and in communication. And now with digital communication, we saw it even in its most beautiful expression of itself as, or, as an organizing tool during the Arab Spring or during the Ferguson uprising, where even during the Ferguson uprising, which was after the Arab Spring, there were many people from, um, from our Arab nations and from Palestine in particular, who messaged the young people who were being attacked and tear gassed how to alleviate the pain and what to do. And so um, organizing and activism is, is still a, an important, important part of our democracy and our voice. One of the other things I wanted to bring up because, um, um, I'm sorry, I've, I think it was Paul said, um, they would guesstimate a vote, you know, they would raise their hands or throw a pebble or something like that. And I think there's very there's a lot of us here in the United States who still feel in some ways like that is how they the the what we'll call the opposition to our perspectives wins. Um, we have a thing here called the Electoral College where um, you know, pending on how many people are in your state, you have a number of representatives that go um, go and participate. Um, at, uh, at, uh, at the ballot box for you in a sense. Um, and excuse me, it's not about how many people you have, but it has to do with the redistricting and it has to do with gerrymandering. It has to do with a lot of American terms that are, it's too much for me to go into. But what I will say is that there are many places in the United States and what happens is you have an electoral college, the people cast their vote, and then the representatives of this electoral college take what the majority wants and then they go to the floor of, of, um, the, of the government and then they cast their vote. So you win electoral votes. And I hope that was ex explanatory enough for some folks who may or may not know about it. The thing that is pr problematic though, is that it does not fully represent the people because in some places there are actually a lot of people where there'll only be maybe two or three electorates and in other places where there's far less people, where there maybe have four electorates for whatever reason. And so the will of the people's voice really is still not heard because of this electoral college. And you have to have a certain amount of electoral votes to win the presidency and the vice presidency. These are the only two um, houses of government that we use this electoral college. And it was really all created still to control 
poor people and people of color. And this is still ongoing. So right now in this time of COVID where the, the Democrats more so than the Republicans, but both sides of governments take this time from now until November when we have our presidential election to go door knocking, to really bring people's awareness to uh, the issues and create um, questions around some of the policy um, um, platforms that some of our candidates are running under. And because of COVID, we cannot do that. So back full circle to some of the organizing and the way in which we are using our activism now, um, many, many groups are relying not only on the digital space, of course, but also on culture. For the first time, we're relying on culture more than ever before because it is through music, it is through films, it is through um, spoken word, it is through all kinds of forms of uh, theatrical presentation where we can get messages across and now we have to use this digital space in ways in which to organize that we have never really had to before and certainly we're, we're hopeful that it will work. One of the things that the um, nonprofit organization that I run, Sankofa.org, um, I'll put it in the chat here for those who want to um, check it out. Um, it, we, um, we use art as a tool to organize. And so, um, though I sent it to you, hopefully you can share it with everyone else. Um, we use art and culture to organize and to use art and culture as protest and to um, give voice to disenfranchised folks and to people who have thoughts and images and um, concepts that don't normally get a platform, especially in the political theater. So <clears throat> we are right now working with young poets and we are working with um, animators to create content that can be uploaded, especially to, to uh, communicate to young people the importance of their vote and the importance of securing their vote. And so we're using the, the medium of film and we are um, creating these animated, because we are in quarantine still, we are trying to find ways in which to engage our young people, to employ some of our young people. And so we have young um, uh, poets who are creating one to two minute videos uh, for content and young animators that will illustrate the content so that we can get out and organize folks to vote and to let people have a deeper understanding of how important the vote is because really that is the most important freedom we have in our democracy is our vote. Um, you know, there's still tremendous issues in the United States around racism and police brutality. And we are finding ways still also to organize around those. Uh, in some ways, some of our voices have been heard louder in the United States than ever before. Um, and again, we're using the digital space in order to um, get our voices out. And, and even in some cases, the other day, I was part of a Zoom meeting like this, and it was um, open and we were excited. It was a group of black women who were coming forward. Um, and it was the daughter, we're called Daughters of the Movement. And it's daughters of Dr. Betty Shabazz and Malcolm X, the daughters of Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, who are um, actors in the United States that were very, very, um, very um, vocal about their position and activists. It's the daughter of a political strategist here by the name of Bill Lynch. It's the granddaughter of someone by the name of Percy Sutton. It's the daughter of Reverend Al Sharpton, who is a, ver a very vocal voice in our community for issues where it relates to communities of color. And it's also um, the daughter of Diane Carroll. And so we had a, a forum just like this, where we were what they call Zoom bombed, where we were, um, um, sort of infiltrated by white supremacists. We were, um, several of them took over some of the video screens and began to masturbate and show parts of their body. In the chat area, they sent out such messages of misogyny and hate, things that I don't really want to repeat, but really negative, horrible 
horrible things. And maybe I should repeat them so that you can understand the level of hate that resides all over the world, but also very deeply here in America. They were saying things like, we want to rape you black bitches, niggers, I hate niggers, I hate women. I mean, really horrible, horrible things. Over a hundred messages, over, I'm sorry, 500 messages in the chat over and over and over again. And so we immediately um, found other organizers and other organizations that were now holding Zoom accountable to make sure that they create safe spaces on, in their technology for all of our um, you know, black and brown people who now, especially in quarantine, have to rely on spaces like Zoom or Google or other places to hang out for us to come together in community. So I hope that helps a little bit in sort of letting you know a little bit about what we're doing, what we do, and some of the challenges that we face here in the United States ongoing. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, actually, I, I really want to share uh, my emotions, both of our emotions. We are shocked to hear what you just said. Um, it's uh, full of hope to use the technology, but of course it opens door also for what you just experienced. And when we talked with each other the last time on the phone, I was getting online, I was sharing that last moment of the Markham X uh, celebration, and I was really full of hope like you just shared with us, but there's a dark side of it and we have to be really careful about it. I would now like to give the opportunity to Paul to maybe comment what Gina just said and also to Lex that we get some interaction between the three of you. Please, uh, maybe Paul starts first, right? Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you very well. So uh, Gina, it's such a privilege both to hear you and to see you. I wish I could see you physically. I'm finding this separation extremely difficult. But on the other hand, I was deeply depressed as Jochen and Alexandra by that Zoom bombing. And it's sort of like a parallel to the um, interference with uh, Facebook and uh, other uh, media by way of the Cambridge Analytica scandal that in other words, the possibilities of this wonderful way of communicating also include the possibilities of its being um, zoom bombed and uh, distorted. So we have to be alert. I don't wish to downplay, if I gave the wrong impression, that activism of your sort and other sorts of online activism, one of my former students is uh, a very strong proponent of uh, what he calls the new citizenship uh, order. And, and I think there's a great deal that young people especially can do actively through online virtual meetings. It's absolutely crucial, but they must be alert to the dangers that lurk or that actually obtrude. And you mentioned some very far right people. Well, you probably know that there are some particularly horrible, especially in America, people who exploit um, classical texts because sadly, of course, there are misogynists in every society and there are therefore misogynist texts that you can exploit. But for example, Donna Zuckerberg, the sister of uh, the founder Mark of um, Facebook, she suffers personally as well as uh, institutionally the sort of abuse that you uh, are mentioning. And she's fought back. She has recuperated what the ancient world can give us in a positive way. But nevertheless, there's a torrent of filth out there that we have somehow to try to counteract. And so thank you. Your example to me, to others, is absolutely a shining one. You're a wonderful person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I wanted to just also say that, um, you know, I, the reason, and one of the things I said earlier on was about, about an evolution, not just a revolution. And I think that it's really important to not just, I mean, certainly we need to counteract that and we need to mute some voices in some cases, in some ways, but I also wish that we could finally found, find a way as a global human family to really get to the root of hate, to the root of feeling the need to be powered over another human being. Yeah. 
because I understand that our minds work in different ways. And, you know, I understand that, you know, we need some sense of order per se, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if we can sort of, if we got rid of governments, could we actually govern ourselves? Would we find a way to have equity? I'm sure it wouldn't work right away, but, you know, I wish that there was just a way that we could really deal with people's mental health and early childhood development and places where their chemistry and their environment together maybe had issue and that those things could be addressed and seen early on. Because I feel like it is, it's more than just changing laws. It's more than just, more than just, you know, voting for people who sort of get the idea, you know, or voting for the lesser of the two evils, or we really have to take a deeper look. I feel once again, this sort of American experiment in capitalism, you know, I, it's so interesting that that Hamilton has this great Broadway show and is being sort of put on a quasi pedestal. And yet I would wonder what he would think about our capitalist democracy at this time. Um, you know, I, I, I just really feel like what we're in need of and what I so appreciate about the World Human Forum is an evolution of ideas, an evolution of d digging deeper and looking more deeply into the human condition and the power and, and, and the imagination that we all bring to envision something new and something that perhaps we've never experienced before. But that's why I really talk a lot about that we need an evolution, not just a revolution. There are two things I'd love to share in this conversation, if, 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 if I could, and thank you so much, um, uh, Gina, for bringing so many things to, to the fore that, that, I, um, that I wholeheartedly uh, agree with. One is the role of women um, to make democracy work. Um, one of the seminal studies in collective intelligence was done at MIT uh, in the early 2000s, and they took groups of, of 10 to 15 people, gave them complex problems to solve and, and, and saw and evaluated how well they did as groups. And they looked at, okay, the groups that did better, what were the, what were the common uh, uh, factors that, that made these groups uh, potentially uh, uh, perform better? And, um, and they, found, uh, they found two main factors. One uh, was their ability to share uh, the right to speak, the, the groups that were better at sharing, uh, that were less dominated by a single voice, um, were better at solving problems as a group. And the second was the number of women, that groups that had half or greater than half women were the highest performing groups. And so these are things that maybe we intuitively we, we uh, always knew, but that science is starting to show that as societies, um, we can only create fair, resilient societies um, if women have not only equal power, but in some cases more than equal power. And you look at the countries like New Zealand, like Finland, um, that have been the most successful in dealing with this COVID crisis, well, what do they have in common? They have women as their heads of state. So that, that's one thing that I think uh, we, we, have to, we have to point out. Um, the second is the role of art. And something that, um, uh, that Paul, in, in his book, Democracy of Life, which I will plug here, um, uh, that everyone should, should, uh, should find a copy of, uh, points out is, is how, uh, how much the cultural life of Athens um, was critical to the democratic life of Athens. That uh, in order to work through exactly the problems you just said, Gina, um, how do we educate our children? Um, how do we deal with competing loyalties? We're loyal to our family. What happens if our family loyalties uh, conflict with our loyalties to the law of the state? Well, and this book is literally the one that I found in Delphi when I was in Delphi. It's about Aeschylus uh, and, and, uh, and the role of Greek tragedy and the theater and these great festivals that brought the entire society together to see each other in the daytime um, and, and think through these, these, these big questions that they could not have been good citizens without good culture. Um, and the last thing I'll say is it's not a coincidence, I don't think, um, that the first day that Paris uh, was open uh, after the confinement, two months, I went to my favorite place uh, in this city, Shakespeare and Company bookstore, uh, which has expanded and started selling records. And literally the first thing that I bought on the first day of the deconfinement. 
Oh my God, that's hysterical. And I'll just on a side note, one of my first jobs in New York City was at Shakespeare and Company Bookstore. So <laughs> there you go. These are the connections Connected. that the World Human Forum makes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> May I come back? Yes, please. Um, Gina, you mentioned Electoral College. Well, by ancient Greek standards, the Electoral College is what they would have called an oligarchic institution. And oligarchy means rule of the few. And you mentioned, of course, Hamilton, and I would add Jay, Madison. They, none of them were egalitarian Democrats. And the very word democracy, in fact, until the 19th century, was something of a boo word, not a hooray word, because it was so easily shadable into or misrepresentable as mob rule. And therefore, one had to come up with something, and of course we now speak of representative as opposed to direct democracy, we speak of republican democracy as opposed to pure democracy, all these ways in which we've evolved away from the ancient Greek original model in ways that more are compatible with our society. But your constitution, I don't know quite how you're going to do anything about this, but one of my former PhD students in Cambridge, Danielle Allen, has written a brilliant book about your constitution. But one of its problems, because of your amendments, because of your um, original written constitution is that it's very difficult to change and you have a supreme court which is by ancient Greek standards also an oligarchic institution so until and unless you get rid of the electoral college system you're not going to have a popular vote for your president determining the outcome as that's with the right. last one. So I'm just saying that's just looking at your constitution from an ancient Greek point of view, an ancient Greek Democrat will be deeply upset that you are not really democratic in exactly. certain fundamental ways. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think that is why a lot of us as organizers and artists are using the tools of culture to get these messages across so that and really educate young people. So there's a dip, deeper understanding. I mean, I certainly, for instance, I have a 23 year old daughter and at her age, I didn't know about the electoral college and what it all meant. And I mean, it's, it's already confusing enough when we go to the ballot box and see like for instance all of the judges that we have a choice to vote for and all of the people running for district attorney well what do they really do and what how do they really work i mean you really have to have a certain level of um intelligence to have a deeper understanding of all of the different people who are running, all of the different positions and what they really stand for and what they really do. I mean, in our case, we have something, someone called a district attorney and we have someone called a judge. Well, some people don't know the difference, but there are big differences. And it's the difference of sending your loved one away to prison for life or sending them to a diversion program where they can work through their drug addiction or their mental illness or something else. And so um, they, it, I think it is by design to have it con very confusing. Um, I think that, you know, when they looked at um, slavery, when they looked at controlling people of color or people with different points of view, they had to find the intellectuals, found ways in which to make it extremely difficult and extremely um, confusing. But we are slowly chipping away and having each hopeful generation learn more and more and if there is an actual globe to inhabit, um, hopefully each generation will, you know, do better for the human experience and for the human um, human idea. I think I think there's something really beautiful in, in what you just said um, about the the confusing nature of the political systems that we inhabit, and one of the one of the things that New York City has done, interestingly, that is, it actually makes it very similar to ancient Athens is something called participatory budgeting, which um, was an idea that came from Brazil um, that was actually created in the transition from dictatorship to democracy in the late 1980s uh, around the idea of giving direct control over a part of the city budget to citizens in their neighborhoods to propose projects and the winning projects would, would be funded. And now New York City 
uh, is the largest city in America uh, that does this. Paris also does it, Lisbon, many, many cities. Uh, Scotland is a leader in this as well. Um, and uh, why is this important? Because as you say, if you have never directly experienced democracy beyond going into a voting booth, what incentive do you have to learn about it? Um, and, and only by actually being in the meeting, being listened to and, and knowing that you could have some impact on whether we create solar panels or bike lanes or fix the, the, the air conditioning in the school where your kids go or in all the different things that these participatory processes can do, that's what changes citizenship. Um, not you know clicking like on your on your Facebook feed, but uh, the kinds of things that Athenian citizens did because every year there was a lottery, and if you were chosen onto the council onto the boule, you had this boot camp. You went and 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 learned everything uh, about <coughs> how uh, budgets worked, how you know streets were fixed, how you organized you know festivals and the money system, and these are things that American citizens have been infantilized and, and told that this is experts, you know, lawyers will deal with this, don't worry about it. Um, whereas this should be the business of, of every citizen. And thanks to things like PB, participatory budgeting in New York City, which is a small scale, but, but you know, a good yeah. sign, um, these are the kind of ways in which citizenship can, can evolve, as you say. Yes, absolutely. I stay, ho I remain hopeful. You know, I remain hopeful. I feel like there are a lot of young people. You know, it's interesting. I, I look at our um, particular uh, presidential race right now. And, you know, I, I really don't want this to happen, but there is a small part of me that wonders, do we need to somehow dismantle this democracy altogether in some way and let this particular person who's inhabiting the White House currently have another run of it, which would completely destroy the democracy, I think. Um, and um, there's a question in me. I mean, I know what I really want, which is, of course, no, please, God, no. <laughs> but there is another part of me that I think this sort of like, sort of quasi... Um, Revolutionary. Yes, <laughs> it's like maybe we need to have it get really, really worse, really worse, because there's not enough people who see how bad it really is um, in order for it to actually, you know, have a, a, a tremendous shift. I mean, this was, this was the real story of the American um, political primary, the Democratic primary between, you know, revolution and reform. Um, yes. And I think that people on more of the Bernie Sanders or Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez uh, side want much greater structural changes to American capitalism, <laughs> democracy. Um, you know, they're not violent. They're not. They're not calling for revolution in the streets. But um, the the tone is is a is a much more um, deeply critical one, including of other Democrats uh, who are perceived as part of. Uh, the establishment this year, I supported uh, candidate Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who was talking about um, changing the Supreme Court, the you know, kinds of things, Gina, that you, that you point at as deep problems with American democracy, electoral college. Why should we put up with the fact that twice in our lifetimes, the person who had less votes, fewer votes, wins the election? Why should we put up with that? Well, it's because, well, it's always been that way. Um, and so the more that our politicians can be thinking systemically, uh, thinking about not just how do we you know, fix healthcare and, and renewable energy and early education, but also the electoral college and redistricting and the Supreme Court. It's not one or the other. Unless we, we think for the long term, we won't be able to, um, to make the short term uh, solutions either. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. I'm sure our participants will understand why we didn't allow them to come in with questions because we could have spent at least twice as much time and I promise you one thing, we will invite all of you, the three of you back to Greece to continue this fascinating discussion on democracy, of what we can learn from the past and what we need for the future. And I really, really want to thank you so much for having been our guests today. And uh, I promise we will be back with you 